Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for podcasters by podcasters. Podcasting Smarter is the official podcast from Podbean, featuring podcasting interviews, best practices, and helpful tips. We're here to give you the tools, resources, product updates, and news to help you get started podcasting and keep your podcast growing. Hello, and welcome to Podcasting Smarter. This is Norma Jean Belenke, Podbean's Head of Events. And in today's episode, we're having a conversation with Ariel Nissenblatt, Head of Community and Content at Squadcast.fm and founder of Earbuds, where we'll talk about building your podcast community, recording best practices, and so much more. Stay tuned. And here we go. Hi, Ariel. How's it going? I love that intro. That was so radio. That was so cool. <laughs> I'm great. How are you? <laughs> Good. Good. We like to get excited here at Podcasting Smarter. So first of all, tell us what inspired you to become involved in the podcasting industry because you're kind of everywhere these days, all over LinkedIn. You're speaking at a lot of conferences. So how did you first get started working within the podcasting industry? I was a listener first, loved podcasts, discovered them in 2014, and then started listening more and more over the years. And in 2016, I moved to Los Angeles and traffic mixed with having a long commute, mixed with not really loving my job, mixed with wanting to learn things, mixed with the 2016 election and trying to everything is possible led me to say it would be really cool if I could work in this medium that I am being so entertained by. So I made it my mission to get a job in the audio slash podcast slash radio space. Took me a while, but I finally figured out a way in. And here I am six years later, fully employed in podcasting. I did not think it was possible at the time, but it is. It absolutely is. And now you're with Squadcast. So tell us a little bit about Squadcast. And then I want to jump in to Earbuds Collective as well. Yes. Squadcast is a remote recording platform that helps podcasters, anybody recording interviews or anything that they need to record over an internet connection. You can do that on Squadcast. You get high quality video and audio and you can record with anyone, anywhere, at any time. And it's a web-based connection. So you don't need to download an app. You just send somebody a link. They join on the session, you press record. And when you're finished, you get your files, you can mix them right then and there on Squadcast if you want, or you can download them separately and do with them what you please. So we have podcasters using it. We have audiobook creators using it, audio drama people. We've got people who record interviews for TikTok or for YouTube or so many different use cases. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have a link here in the comments for everybody who wants to check it out. Um, And tell us also about Earbuds Collective, which is really a passion project of yours. Yeah. Earbuds is what got me into the podcast space in the first place. I, like I was saying, uh, was living in Los Angeles and wanted to work in the podcast space, but also wanted to listen to more podcasts. And I didn't know how to do that at the time because even in 2016, which is when I first had the idea for Earbuds, there were hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there. And I was listening to the same five or six every week. And my friends were also listening to the same five or six every week. And it was sort of an echo chamber of content, NPR, NPR adjacent content, things that were being created by people who left NPR to start their own podcast. So I'm talking like Radio Lab, This American Life, 99% Invisible, The Memory Palace, You Must Remember This, shows like that, shows that are very high quality, really entertaining. And I loved them, but I wanted more and I knew that there was more out there. And my concern was that I was missing content (laughs) and that I would never get a chance to listen to all of the beautiful podcasts out there. And I know that I still never will. And people say this about books all the time. They say, you just have to, at a certain point, accept that you're never going to lay your eyes, lay your ears on all of the beautiful stuff out there. And you just have to sort of be okay with that. But I do think that we can get closer. So my thought was with earbuds, what if each week somebody else curated a list of their five favorite podcasts and they put that list under a theme and then they sent that list out under the earbuds name. So that's why the word uh, collective is within earbuds. So it's earbuds podcast collective. And I started it in January of 2017. That's when I first sent an email out to a bunch of friends and said, what is this? What does a podcast collective look like to you? What should we call it? My friend Naomi came up with the name earbuds because it's earbuds. It has a double meaning. Friends who listen to podcasts and also the things that you put in your ears. And it morphed over the years. The first uh, newsletter went out 
to people who had opted in February 13th, 2017, sent by me. The theme was New Beginnings. And then every single week since then, every single Sunday night, I've never missed a Sunday night, although sometimes I have sent it on a Monday morning after being at a wedding on Sunday night, for example. But I can't. I, I just say it's Sunday somewhere. And um, I've sent it out and I have connected with podcast listeners and podcast creators all over the world, have had hundreds and hundreds of lists hundreds and hundreds of themes, thousands of podcasts recommended. And it has also gotten me jobs in the podcast space. So I still do it on the side of all of the other jobs that I do. And it keeps me in tune with podcasts that are being launched. It keeps me in tune with creators. It keeps me in tune with trends. And I am constantly entertained. And while I will never come close to listening to all the podcasts out there, I have definitely come closer to being exposed to things that I would never be exposed to otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's definitely you can hear the passion in your voice because I think everybody who works in podcasting gets into podcasting because we love podcasts. And so there is this kind of like, oh, I'm never going to... And as podcasts grow, right? It's like now there's millions and millions of podcasts out there. It's like, I'm never going to be able to listen to all of them. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) It's really something where to broaden your reach, whether it's within other genres or within maybe shows that you wouldn't have found organically. It's really fun to see what's out there. And like you said, now you really do have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in terms of trends and creators and podcasting. And your butts has really grown as well. Yeah. Yeah. Over the years, I have learned a lot about email marketing. I have learned a lot about social media and how to promote on social media. I've also gone to events and represented earbuds and I've made connections with events like Outlier Podcast Festival. And every year at Outlier Podcast Festival, we have a pitch competition named after earbuds. So I have also learned a lot about making connections and partnerships and spreading the word about this newsletter that I honestly just think will help people find more podcasts to listen to. I don't have hopes of making thousands and millions of dollars from thousands and millions. I don't have hopes of becoming rich off of earbuds, but I do love to use it as a tool to meet new people and to find somebody their next favorite show. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we've had other guests on the show speak about this, about being audience forward, right? You're doing it because you love it, but also you're thinking about the value for the audience. You're thinking about the value of the person who's going to open that newsletter. What are they going to be excited to discover in terms of new podcasts, new episodes, new creators? So I think that's a really important aspect. And I want to talk about community building because we've we've already kind of touched our toe into those waters. Um, but can you talk about a particularly successful community building initiative? Um, and and I mean, I think, you know, with earbuds, you you really have built a large community. So what contributed to that success and what did you really learn along the way? Yeah, the way that I initially grew the earbuds newsletter was friends and friends of friends and family and people that those people were connected to. It really was a grassroots effort to start out, which is what you will hear from podcast marketing people when they talk about how to grow your first 100 downloads for your show is who are the people who are tuning in? Why are they tuning in? What do they tune in for? And what makes them keep coming back? And you are advised to have those conversations directly with your listeners. What do you want out of the show? And how can I give it to you? And how are there more people like you? You know, so that's really some of the tactics that I used in order to grow my newsletter at first. It was, like I said, initially, I was sending out the earbuds newsletter on Gmail to about 50 people, BCCing all of them. And it was friends and friends of friends and people that I'd heard through friends of friends like, oh, this person listens to podcasts. Therefore, they're going to opt in to be in my newsletter. And then maybe some people will reply to me and say, hey, can I send this to somebody else? And the answer is, of course, yes. And then after a few months of sending out the email on Gmail, I accidentally CC'd everybody rather than BCCing everybody. And (laughs) then I was like, you know what? I should probably learn how to use MailChimp. And then that really jump started my marketing efforts because I also realized that I needed a website. And I also realized that the website needed to have a really great landing page and that that landing page was optimized for people to actually subscribe to the newsletter and not just give tons and tons of wordy information or images. It needed to be clear and concise. And what are you going to get out of this newsletter? So all of these things built on each other in order to grow my newsletter. And then while I was growing the newsletter, I was also living in Los Angeles and I was trying to get a full-time job in the podcast space. And one of the ways that I eventually did get employed in the podcast space was 
I pitched the idea of a podcast librarianship or like a podcast liaison to a bunch of different co-working spaces throughout Los Angeles. I essentially cold emailed like five co-working spaces and said, I would like to be your podcast liaison for your co-working space. I want you to hire me to come in once a week and talk to people about what podcast they should be listening to and talk to people about how to start podcasts and talk to people about the business of podcasting. And a few places were interested, but one in particular said, sounds great. Would you also build us a studio? And I pretended that I knew what I was doing and I built them a studio. And then I worked for them for about a year and a half running the studio. And while I was doing that, I also got to use the the space to host networking events. And my main thing when I was hosting those networking events was, hey, you should use this studio, but you should also subscribe to my newsletter because my newsletter is a really great way to be plugged into the podcast space and to find out what other shows are out there and to find out who you should be collaborating with. And I was honing all of these messages by being exposed to all these different creators in the Los Angeles area who were either making podcasts or were interested in making podcasts. So all of these things over time, coupled with buying ads in a few newsletters, being featured editorially in a few newsletters, being talked about on other podcasts, and a whole bunch of other things led me to have a couple thousand subscribers to, or more than a couple thousand subscribers to the Earbuds newsletter over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that story. I think a lot of people when they see someone, especially within the podcasting industry, who's working for a podcasting company, speaking at conferences, and they think, oh, wow, you know, how did they get there? It really started with like, hey, I was BCCing everybody (laughs) on a Gmail that I sent out and I learned it along the way. And I think that's what's so great about podcasting, right? You don't have to be the best or know exactly, you know, the, the most professional way of doing things. You just have to do them and you have to have that passion. And then, you know, the next step will reveal itself as you're going. So yeah, and keep going too. I mean, I could have stopped so many times along the way because my newsletter was not growing. A lot of people like to see huge spikes in growth when they run a newsletter or when they run a podcast. But if I had stopped every time my podcast only, or sorry, if I had stopped every time my newsletter only got like 10 new subscribers every week, even five new subscribers every week, I would have stopped so long ago, but I will continue. <laughs> I will not stop because it is just, I do it for so many reasons. I don't just do it for growth. The reason I started the newsletter initially was because I wanted to listen to more podcasts. I wanted to listen to podcasts curated by other people on a theme and my thought is that those themes, those curations are going to be helpful for other people and that they're also evergreen. You know, you can go back to the archives from 2017 and find a curated list on sports podcasts. And just because those episodes are old doesn't mean that you can't listen to them. There's, they still have a lot of value. So I continue to do what I am doing, even if I don't see sharp spikes in growth every single week. Yeah. And I think that's such an important aspect of building community, right? It's not instant sometimes. Sometimes it is. But in those moments where it is instant, everybody doesn't always see the years of work behind that moment, right? right. So <laughs> it's definitely important to remember that. Um, and what do you think are the most important elements of building a strong and engaged podcasting community? I think you have to find out first if your community wants to be grouped together. I think the word community tends to or in the past few years has sort of become this buzzword. Everybody wants to build community around their podcast or around their newsletter or around their digital content creation, whatever it is, build community around their community. (laughs) People really like that word. And I think the first thing to think about is how many communities can a person possibly join? Think about it from your own point of view. How many communities do you belong to and how many of them are you active in? For me personally, I listen to Today, I listened to, I think, seven hours of podcasts. I was about to do the math before I came on here. It was a big listening day for me. And I am definitely not involved in all of the communities that the podcasts that I listen to have because it would be impossible. So you need to think about if you are going to start a community, what does that community look like? And what can you reasonably expect from a community member in terms of commitment? And what do you really want from them? And what is the reason that you are starting this community? Is your content something that lends itself to community discussions? Or should it be events? Or should it be uh, an asynchronous Slack channel? Or a synchronous, like maybe you have more events that are online. You know, there's just so many ways that your community could look like. There are so many things that your community could look like. And I think it's worth thinking about and having conversations with your most engaged listeners, people who reach out to you and tell you that they loved your most recent episode. It's worth it to ask them, hey, 
would you be interested in being part of a community? And if they say, oh, yeah, that that could be interesting. That's not an enthusiastic yes. <laughs> it really has to be something that people are clamoring for because or else you're going to be pulling teeth. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's such an important aspect, right? How many listeners listen to not just your podcast, but others, right? Many others right. In, in our cases. And, you know, what do they want out of your community? Maybe it's that they want merch, right? <laughs> Maybe it's right. that they want to follow you on Twitter. Maybe they want to go to in-person events. Maybe they want a newsletter. But it is really important to tailor that to where you're going to get the best response. Um, and and what are some of the biggest challenges you've faced, um, but that also you've seen podcasters face in terms of building community? Yeah, uh, a challenge that I have faced in building community is which platform it should be on, how often the community wants to meet synchronously, what events should exist for this community, how to retain people beyond just the initial onboarding process and then maybe a few weeks of engagement. These are just some of the things that pop up, but you know, not all of them are addressable, but they're important to be things that you consider when you are building your community from the out start. I think, for example, when somebody joins the Squadcast community, you can go to squadcast.fm slash community to learn more about the community. And when you're there, you sign up for a newsletter. And when you sign up for that newsletter, I get your email address in my inbox. And then um, you have also opted in to join our Slack channel. So I add you to our Slack channel. And then it's my job within the Slack channel to make you feel engaged and welcome and ask you to introduce yourself. And then it's kind of up to you what you want from the community. I have let you know through our onboarding sequence, through emails and through the Slack channel now that these are all the things that are now available to you on the in the Squadcast community. So what do you want to do with that? Did you join the Squadcast community because of one of the bullet points on squadcast.fm slash community that said you can join our beta program or maybe you want to join our affiliate program or maybe you want to attend member exclusive events or maybe you want access to Squadcast uh, meet and greets with our engineering team. There's so many reasons that you could potentially join our community, but then um, did we deliver on the promise? So these are just some of the things that you might be thinking about when you're joining a community. And then multiply that times 10, because when you are a podcaster, you're using Squadcast, but you're also using a hosting site. You're also using an editor. You're also using a marketing software, potentially. There's so many different things for you to possibly be engaged with. And are you going to be involved in all of those communities? Because they're probably all really great. <laughs> so there's just so many places where you might lose somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And at Podbean, you know, as a hosting company, it's something where we realize that as well. There's there's just so many facets of building your podcast, right? I mean, for us, it's a complete solution, but something where, you know, there are editing, there's now there's a bunch of companies that are doing captions, right? Social media captions, yeah. show notes. It's really interesting the different communities out there for different steps in a specific podcast's production process, right? So that's a, that's a really important aspect as well. I mean, just to kind of follow up, how have you navigated these challenges? From what I'm hearing, it sounds like you really ask. Yeah, we definitely do a lot of conversations with creators. We try to do a quarterly town hall with the Squadcast community where we ask them, what does this community look like to you? What does it look like in actuality? And what does an ideal version of this community look like? And then there are also people who sort of self-identify as leaders within the community. Maybe they post the most or they DM me and they offer suggestions and they ask questions. And those are the people that I sort of rely on to be able to ask more personalized questions. You know, what do you think the average community member wants from this space. And so I, I definitely rely on the people who have self-selected. I definitely rely on the people who have made it clear that this is something that's important to them. And I then take that and I apply that to the rest of the group. And if it works, I double down. If it doesn't work, I go in a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something where, you know, podcasters of all sizes, podcasting companies, you know, across the board, it's really easy to say, oh, we think we know what people want or, oh, we asked a year ago and this is kind of how we built things from there. But to continue that conversation is important. Yeah, I think that a lot of people stop at customer acquisition, but in this case, it's community member acquisition. You got them to the Slack channel. Good job. The numbers will look great for a month. But retention and continued engagement is very important when you are outlining your KPIs for what a successful community looks like. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I want to ask you next, because there's there's a lot of different kinds of personalities and reasons why people are in podcasting, right? There's hobbyists, there's professionals, there's people who are just starting out, there's people who are seasoned veterans. So how do you balance the needs and, and interests of different types of podcasters within a community? If the community of people who have opted in to join our Slack channel was thousands and thousands and thousands of people, then we would probably have affinity groups within. But because it's only almost a thousand people, we can treat it a little bit differently because you can imagine at any given time, only a percentage of those people, a big percentage, but a percentage of those people are going to be actively producing new episodes. Some are going to be on hiatus. Maybe they're going to come back in a few months. Then a percentage of those people maybe are on vacation. Then a percentage of those people, there's just so many different potential subgroups within the people who are opted in to the Slack channel. We also have Facebook groups. We also have other ways for people to be in touch with uh, with the Squadcast community or to be in community with Squadcast. But I think because it is not such an overwhelming number of active people at all times, we are able to sort of treat conversations on the Slack channel at least like not a monolith, of course, there are definitely different use cases within, but most of the questions, most of the comments, most of the articles that are shared apply to the majority of people. So it's a lot of people within the Slack channel who are making podcasts independently or who have a small team. I would say that's the majority of people who have opted in to be active on our Slack channel. Um, Some of our more enterprise clients are not in the Slack channel because they have larger teams or they're working on multiple productions and maybe they're using Squadcast, but maybe one of their other clients won't use Squadcast and they'll only use Zoom. So there's just so many different potential use cases and our Slack channel for the most part has been pretty cohesive. Yeah, absolutely. And for earbuds, how do you have that balance or maintain that balance with, you know, the number of subscribers that you have and the different lists you're curating and the community you've built there? Yeah. What's really interesting about the earbuds lists is I still think, you know, we hear in the U.S. at least that 50% of the population listens to a podcast regularly. I don't know exactly what regularly means. I think it's at least once a month they listen to a podcast, which is great. I would love more, but it's great for now. And my thought is, you know, Earbuds has a few thousand subscribers. I think we should have 100,000 subscribers. I think all the podcast recommendation newsletters should have hundreds of thousands of subscribers because... People need this content curated for them. There is just no way to possibly get through all of the content that's out there. And how do you possibly find what is worth your time? These newsletters will do that for you. So I definitely recommend subscribing not only to earbuds, but also to podcast the newsletter and find that pod and podcast delivery and pod stack. And there's so, so many others that you could be subscribed to. And that's not even talking about the podcast industry newsletters like pod news and sounds profitable. I am just talking right now about the podcast recommendation newsletters and right, editorial curation. Yes. And the, the reason I bring that up is because I want more people to subscribe. However, when I think about why somebody might be subscribed to earbuds, it is different every single week. Each week is curated by a different person and each different person chooses a different theme and finds five podcast episodes on that theme. So if you subscribe to earbuds thinking you're going to get business podcasts, You might get business podcasts every once in a while. But if you only want business podcasts, there is actually a business podcast recommendation newsletter. There's probably a few of them. So I love earbuds because it gives me random podcast recommendations on a theme and I can go back through the archive and I can check out a bunch of different themes and I can use the search bar and find some things. But somebody might not like it because they only want podcasts about X, Y, and Z or sorted in a different direction. So that's, I believe, what is stopping me from growth and from retaining Um, subscribers forever. The average person who subscribes to earbuds subscribes for at least a year, which is great when we talk about average lifetime of the customer. In this case, not a customer. They're not paying for anything, but the community member, I guess. Um, But yeah, that's that's some of the barrier. That that, that is a barrier that I face. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, And on the podcaster side of things, how have you seen podcasting communities, specifically with, I mean, obviously earbuds and Squadcast, how have you seen those communities grow and like incorporate the success of a podcast individually for a specific podcast, but also because you've been running earbuds for for so many years, kind of as a whole in terms of an aggregate within the industry? 
Yeah, I I think there was an article, I believe, in the New York Times a few years ago about niche podcast communities. And it looked at how much these fans of podcasts love the hosts. And I loved that article. It was looking into... So they, they name checked a few specific podcasts and they said, you know, these fans have a name for themselves and these fans have dedicated Facebook groups and people on these Facebook groups meet up in real life and they talk about the podcast. And I think that's a really beautiful way to not only grow a podcast, but also to grow friendships that have blossomed because of a podcast. And I love that. And I want to see more of that. That was a few years ago. I have seen a lot of people build community around their podcasts and then those communities funnel back into the podcast. For example, there's a podcast called Who Weekly, which is a pop culture podcast. I think it comes out twice a week. And it's great. It's really, really fun. And everybody is so checked into this show. Basically, once a week, one of their episodes is a call-in show. They call it the Who Weekly Call-In Show. <laughs> and it only functions because the community is so tapped in and wants to tell the hosts each week what they have learned about pop culture, and then they want to get their take on pop culture. So that's a show that wouldn't function without community and is built on community and the the community is reinforcing the show in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. Can you share any lessons you've learned about building and nurturing a podcast community that might be helpful to aspiring community builders? I'm thinking specifically from the podcaster standpoint of podcasters that have their podcast or just about to launch and want to build an engaged community. Yeah. I believe that if you have a podcast or you are about to launch a podcast and you want to build an engaged community, I alluded to this before, but the number one thing you should do is figure out what community looks like to your audience or to your potential audience. And the way you would do that is to have conversations with your audience if it exists already. And if it doesn't exist already, then with a potentially lookalike audience. So say you have a podcast about fashion what does another podcast about fashion's community look like? Join that community. Lurk in the Slack channel or the Discord server or the Facebook group and see what people are talking about. See what the hosts are doing in order to facilitate conversations within that community and see what you like about that approach and see what you don't like about that approach and steal some ideas. And I'm not saying steal every idea, but I am saying take a note from people who are doing it successfully. And then run that experiment within your own community and see if people are interested. I think when it comes to advertising for your community on your podcast, you need to think about what is unique about the community that you are building that would make somebody want to spend their precious time in a Slack channel, in a Discord server, on a Facebook group, in a Slack or in a text chain with you, in a Patreon, something, anything that makes them spend their time away from what they're doing already. And you've got to assume that they are already doing a lot of things on the internet. And what is it about your community that you are offering that is going to be different, that is going to be worth somebody's time? That's the first thing I would do is figure out who is doing it well and what do you want to take from them? What notes do you want to take from them? Yeah, absolutely. And I really like that stalking. It's it's not quite stalking, but it's joining adjacent communities. Well, hopefully (laughs) you make a podcast about fashion because you really love fashion and it actually would be helpful for you to be in another Facebook group about fashion. Right. And I, I think it's important also to realize you know, not just the content you're creating, because from a podcasting standpoint, from from a podcaster standpoint, it's so exciting, you know, when you have this new project, and you're, you know, really excited to bring your voice out into the world. Um, but it's also important to to look around and to see how you navigate the landscape of your genre, or of your topic, and what other podcasts are there and what kind of communities they've built. So I think that that's a really important aspect as well. And I really love like what you said about thinking about where else people are on the internet, right? What else do their days look like? Because maybe you have a podcast about moms or something like that. And, you know, moms don't have that much time, right? So, you know, you got to think about not only who your audience is, but how your audience is engaging on the internet as a whole, where they are, the frequency, the tone, the messaging. I think that's just such an important consideration in terms of building your community. 
Yeah. And what if your podcast is a, a car podcast and somebody is hearing a call to action when they're in the car and they don't have time, they don't have the hands in order to grab their phone and join your community on Facebook. Maybe your your podcast literally is called like the commute podcast and you really have to assume that people are commuting while they're listening to it, in which case community to you at the commute podcast might look like uh, maybe a call in show if somebody's able to get their hands on their phone when they are stopped at a red, I don't even know if that's legal, when they are parked and <laughs> they are in park, you know, there, there's just a lot of barriers that might make somebody not able to join your community or to do your call to action at any one given time. Yeah, they may be more of a newsletter audience for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Get off your phones <laughs> while you're driving. If anyone's listening to this while you're driving, please don't look at your phone. So that's such an important aspect, I think. And just the consideration, of not only what does your audience want, where do they want it? What's the frequency? Um, and then also, we greatly encourage podcasters to reach out to other podcasters here at Podbean because, you know, whether it's guest swap, ad swaps, you know, overall cross promotional opportunities within podcasts. So, what have you seen in terms of network building in terms of podcasts that are adjacent or in the same genre and how they've been able to build their networks and communities even more? Yeah. You said you at Podbean advocate for that. I am a huge advocate for promoting on other people's podcasts, your own content. And that's because in order to grow your show, you need to borrow audience from other people. If you are just starting out, the only way for people who are in your niche, who would be a potentially perfect listener to discover you is for you to appear on a perfect podcast for those listeners. And Podcast people tend to be very collaborative in nature and they tend to be giving and they tend to share with each other because they understand that it will come back to them at some point. And that if I talk about your podcast on my podcast, you'll do the same for me. We're going to share each other's audiences. So fashion podcasts, I actually have worked with a fashion podcast before and what we were able to do for her, it was a it was a person who uh, had worked for years in the fashion industry. She started a podcast interviewing other people in the fashion industry. And what we were able to do is get her on another podcast about fashion once a month to be a correspondent. She would check in from London about what's going on in the fashion world in London for this show that was based in New York City. And that was a really great way to, for to get this person exposed to a new audience and to get this audience exposed to this new person and to trends that are going on in a different country, a different city. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love what you said just at the beginning there. You have to borrow your audience at first. Yes, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Because when you launch, you don't have an audience, right? <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, unless you're putting you know money in, into promotion before you launch, which a lot of large, heavily produced podcasts are able to do with big budgets. But your average podcaster, when you launch, you have to borrow your audience. That's such an important aspect. Yeah. And you can even borrow your audience from yourself. I mean, I, I do this all the time with people. If I am starting to work with a podcast and it's a new podcast for this group of people, but somebody else within their organization has another podcast. And that podcast has a couple thousand downloads per episode. Working out a system where, you know, it's the same company. So maybe the podcast that already has a couple thousand downloads per episode is willing to do a few ad reads for that other podcast. That's a really great way to send some people over from one podcast to the other. Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing this across the industry, right? We're seeing it on, on an independent level. On We're seeing it on a corporate level. We're seeing it on a branded level. So this is a really important tip for everybody out there. You know, find other podcasts that are in your genre, build those relationships, whether you do episode swaps where they come on your podcast and you go on their podcast, whether you do ad swaps, whether you purchase advertising on other podcasts, which we talk about all the time here at Podbean with our ads marketplace, but use yes. the audience that is out there to build your audience. That's such an important tip. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask next about how you approach networking and building relationships within the podcasting industry because it you know you really started with this passion for wanting to find new podcasts and listen to new episodes that you hadn't discovered before and now you know you're working with Squadcast incredible and you're speaking at a lot of conferences and I got to say you are all over my LinkedIn <laughs> so how do you approach networking and building relationships within the podcasting industry I am very, very earnest about how much I love audio and I wear on my sleeve exactly who I want to be. And I started doing this 
you know, I didn't do this initially when I graduated from college. I didn't know what I wanted to do right when I graduated from college. I, I did not. I graduated in 2014. I started listening to podcasts in 2014, but I didn't start officially working in the podcast space until 2017. So for three years, I was kind of working at a bunch of different nonprofits, figuring out what I wanted. I was really unsure, but all the while listening to podcasts. And when I discovered that I loved podcasts and that I wanted to work in podcasting, I started asking people to go for coffee and tell me about how they got to where they were today. And um, I, I didn't explicitly ask for connections or for job interviews or anything like that. But I, I did make it very clear that I love this space. And then people start to started to think of me as somebody who might be perfect for X, Y, and Z because she has so much passion for this space. And then I just started saying, I have so much passion for this space. I will do X, Y, and Z. And then people take you to do X, Y, and Z because you have said explicitly that you will do X, Y, and Z. And over time, I've built up a reputation as somebody who just like loves audio and wants to to do anything to do with audio. And of course, I now have my preferences. I like marketing. I like audience development. But I also like stick me in anywhere. And I, I'm, a, I'm a general store of information when it comes to the podcast space. I, I, I don't know too much about the technical side of things, but I'm really, really skilled on the marketing, the audience development, even the production and uh, even uh, storytelling, things like that. I really listen to a lot of podcasts about podcasting, which helps. But I think it all balls down to I am very clear about what I want and how I want to be perceived, which is somebody who just loves this space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's a really effective strategy, right? Yes. People in podcasting are really excited about podcasting. We love podcasting. We want to talk to you. So, you know, ask us out for a coffee, you know, or say, hey, you know, can I do an informational interview? like like a job interview but I just want to know how you got to where you are and you know what that career path looked like because podcasting is a new medium and I agree. it's really exciting we're still in a really exciting <laughs> yeah. time as an industry so we're all in podcasting because we love it so Absolutely. Uh, well, we ask everybody here at Podcasting Smarter the same couple of questions. So <laughs> this is going to be a fun one. But what podcast do you listen to? Maybe just the ones you listen to today. <laughs> okay, I will actually read for you from the podcast that I listened to today. Okay, so I started off this morning with The Daily Zeitgeist, which is a comedy show about the news that I listen to every single day. It's about an hour long. Then I listen to Pod News, which I'm sure everybody here knows. Yeah, we love Then Pod I news. listen to, of course, then I listen to On with Kara Swisher to catch up on tech news. Then I listen to Up First from NPR to find out what's going on in the U.S. in terms of news. Then I listen to Vibe Check with Sam Sanders, Saeed Jones, and Zach Stafford, which is sort of pop culture. Then I listen to Pop Culture Happy Hour. I guess I like pop culture. And that was um, recapping a movie that I just watched called Rye Lane. Then I listened to the BBC's Global News podcast. Then I listened to This American Life. Then I listened to Consider This. And then I listened to The Daily Zeitgeist again because they also have an afternoon show. It's much shorter. Then I listened to Today Explained. And then I am in the middle right now of a show called The Productivity Show. And that's just today. <laughs> that is a lot of shows. I know. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Well, yeah, thank you for that. And I know that you listen to probably not that many shows every single day, but near to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say I had a few meetings today out of my home office. So I was traveling a little bit. So that's why my listening was a little bit higher. But and then I went for a long walk. So I, I got a little bit more in. But I would say every day I, I at least listen to between four and five hours. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And last question, where in your opinion, do you believe the industry is headed? The state of the industry is good. I think that we are okay. I think that podcasters will continue to have ideas for shows and independent creators will continue to create. I love so much about podcasting that there is so much flexibility with what you can do with your creativity. You can imagine a scene and then tell people that that is what is going on because I don't have to use my eyes to believe you. You can just tell me and my ears will believe you. So you can really do what you want with audio and you can come up with a concept that might sound completely ridiculous if it were to be on TV, but it is not ridiculous when it is in audio. And that is why I believe the podcast space will continue and will continue to see so much creativity and so many unique concepts coming out. Absolutely. Well, Ariel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Podcasting Smarter. If you have any podcasting questions or want to get in touch, 
send us an email at podcastingsmarter at podbean.com. Thanks so much and happy podcasting.